So in the last lecture, we talked about the principle of the STT MRI switching. So this is a spin transfer torque. To switch the magnetization of the free layer, you just need to pass large enough current through this MTJ stack. And depending on the direction of the current, then you can flip the magnetization from the anti-parallel state to the parallel state or vice versa. So here the principle is to use the electrons uh, spin state to insert a fork to the free layer. And then the pinned layer has a property just to allow the same direction of the spin state to pass through and then it will reject or reflect the electrons with the other direction of the spin state. So then this is the switching mechanism, and there will be an asymmetry between the AP to P or P to AP switching. Because one is to rely on the transmitted electron, the other one is to rely on the reflected electrons. And if you want to go deeper into the physics, uh, although we don't require that in this course, uh, you can look into this uh, equation, which describes how the spin state switch from one uh, magnetization state to the other one. So basically, this is like a, you can think this is a, like the spin state up and down. And uh, when the current flow, the torque will be applied to the spin state, and the spin state will start oscillating, or let's say rotating around the, you can think this is like North Pole, right? The North Pole and South Pole. So when you apply the, fork, uh, the torque to the spin up state, then the spin up state will start this rotation around this uh, like a North Pole direction. So this is called the, actually called the precession. If you recall the college physics, the mechanics, this is called the precession. This kind of motion is called precession. So if you look at my like a pen, it's like you are going to rotate like this. And then the angle here, this is the theta. And this equation describes the rate you change the angle respect to the North Pole. It depends on the like, external like edge field, the magnetic field, and all the other parameters, including the current you flash, uh, you flash through the MTG stack. So here, basically, there will be the current to uh, to promote this procession. At the same time, there will be damping force, basically the uh, friction torque to prevent this kind of procession. So there are two forces here. And uh, here, if you look at the rate, the d theta over dt, this is essentially the rate. Depends on the current and also the theta, the angle. And uh, here there is a critical threshold current to make sure that the theta can be larger than 90 degree. So that means 90 degree means you, you flip to the, you, you can think this is hemisphere. The, 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 this is like your, if you think this is Earth, right? The north, north side and south side. So if the, theta is larger than 90 degree, then it will flip to the other side, and then this will flip to the south pole. Now, if you look at the trajectory of this spin like state, so you, you can actually predict the trajectory for the switch. It will follow this kind of rotated uh, path. 
So we will not go into the details of the of, of formula here, but basically you can think this is like a procession and damping process. And uh, the there is a current-driven procession, and also there is a thermal activated process. So sometimes when you flip, when, when you rotate, let's say you rotate this angle, and then of course if you apply large enough current, it will must flip. But if you apply not enough, not large enough current, then it will rotate. And then if you remove the current, then it will pull back to the north pole. So this is like S1 before you go to the meta stable point, right? If you remove the noise, it will go back to the original. This one is the same thing. If the current is not not large enough, then it will start this kind of procession. But if the current is withdrawn, then the procession will face the damping force, and then the rotation will go back to the original like North Pole in this case. But sometimes when you do the procession, there will be the thermal noise, right? If you have temperature high enough, that will add some possibility for the flipping. Because as you rotate, then if you are rotating next to this hemisphere, this, then if you have any noise, somehow if the angle is pointing to here, but if you have noise, then somehow it can jump to the next side. So this is the thermal activation assisted flipping. So the flipping can be assisted by the current, which contribute to the procession, and also assisted by the thermal, like the thermal noise. So we will not go into the details of the physics here, but the basic concept is that you apply current, then it starts this procession, and sometimes, even if the current is not large enough, if you have the noise ceremony, then it may also flip. And the next, uh, let's briefly talk about the STT material. And uh, mostly, mostly the magnetization layer is made of this uh, cobalt iron. And sometimes we will have the boron here as well. And the terlonium barrier is MgO. So this was uh, first demonstrated in this uh, Nature Materials paper in 2004. But the STT mechanism was first theoretically predicted by those two papers in the physical review B. So this is a, a theory-driven discovery, actually. So we have the theory first, and later the experimentalist found out the material that allows this STT switching. So when you design the STT M run, as a device engineer or the circuit designer, you care about following metrics. First is the red current density. So what is the critical current you need to apply to flip the state? And the TMR ratio, this is like on-off ratio as we discussed earlier. This will determine your read sense margin and read speed and your sense amplifier design. And we care about the thermal stability. This relates to the data retention and the risk disturb. So, oh, and also the MTG breakdown voltage. This is the maximum voltage you can apply before the MGO layer breaks down. This will relate to the lifetime and endurance. So let's talk about those uh, in the following slides. So here are some formulas, but not very important. So let's talk about the trade-offs between those metrics here. Of course, your goal is to lower the switching current while maintaining high thermal stability. But this is a conflict, actually. So let's look at some of the trade-offs here. The first one is the critical current density. This is the red current density. So density means 
you normalize the current to the cell area. This is because for the STDM run, the current proportional to the area of the MTJ stack. So here we normalize the current to the unit area, and here the unit is 10 to the power 6 ampere per centimeter square. So here, then, this critical current actually depends on the current pulse width. So when you apply a current pulse, the amplitude and the width has a relationship as shown in this figure. So here, for example, when you have larger pulse width, like 1,000 nanosecond or 1 microsecond, so here you need 4 four mega -an per centimeter square. But as you reduce the pulse width, you need to apply higher current. This is easy to be understood, right? Because you apply less, um, less duration, you need to apply higher amount of current to trigger the switching. But still, this is like a thermally activated region. That means in this region, the current density is uh, relatively low. So the situation will be assisted by the thermal noise. And this will depend on the, actually this curve will depend on the temperature. If you have higher temperature, you can imagine you, you, you need less current to flip. But then when the pulse width is below like 10 nanosecond, this goes to the precession region. This is because the duration is short. So the thermal aspect can be uh, negligible because thermally you need to have many trials to disturb the state, right? If your time is so short, then the thermal effect will have less chance to flip. So in this case, if you want to flip, then you have to apply large enough current. And this is the, the precession region. So actually, this will exponentially increase the current to flip. So if you want to flip the state within like a few lot of seconds, then the current density will exponentially go up. So in here, you rely on purely on the current. And uh, ideally, for the advanced MTJ, we wish to reduce the critical current to 1 to 2 mega -an per centimeter square. And you can calculate if your diameter is like 20 nanometer by 20 nanometer, let's say the cell size, if it's a square, or you can think it's a, 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 a circle, then you can calculate the actual current you need to apply given this current density. So, because this thermal, activation, thermal activated process or thermal vibration, the switching actually is stochastic in the MCTTM run. So that means when you apply this, so here in this region, when you apply this kind of pulse width, and the pulse amplitude, the situation oops, is stochastic. That means sometimes it may flip, sometimes it may not. Because as we discussed, right, so you need to make this rotate. And then here, this is thermal assisted. So that, that means here, whether you have that thermal noise or not is a stochastic process. So sometimes it may jump to the other side, and sometimes it will not, so it will go back to the original. So this is a, a, a stochastic process, unless you go to here. If you go to the precession region, then that means you apply not enough current, regardless of the thermal noise. You can always flip, because your current is not enough. But in this case, the current needs to be very high, 
So normally we don't operate the SQDM run in this region because this current red current power will be very large. So here then in the in the thermal assisted region, so we do have this kind of bit error rate versus the right voltage in the right operation. So when you apply the pulses, let's say for example 50 nanoseconds, and then depending on the voltage, right voltage, then the bit error rate means the probability to have a right failure, an error, depends on the voltage, right? If you apply larger voltage, basically larger current, then you will reduce the BER, the bit error rate. So here this is a like a, a exponential scale. So for example, like 0.4 volts, if you apply 50 nanoseconds, then the error probability is pretty low, like 10 to negative 10. So this means like one gigabit, you may have like a one, one error. But if you want to reduce the pulse width to 10 nanoseconds, then you have to apply larger voltage or larger current to ensure the low bit error rate. This is because the stochastic process in the STT switching. So you can think the STTM run is like the S run. Right? So for the S run, it's the same thing, right? So you have to apply large enough, uh, not long enough pulse width, right, to ensure the flipping is successful. And for the S TTM run, the same as S run, if you don't flip, then it will go to the original state. So there's no cumulative effect. So you, if you try once, it does not flip, then the state will go back to the original because of the damping force in the precession. And the other metric is the retention. So here, there's a definition of the thermal stability factor. And essentially, this is like your activation energy divided by KT. And KT is the thermal energy. And in room temperature, you know, it's 26 milli electron volts. So here, then, the two states, like your North Pole, South Pole, actually represent a valley in the energy diagram. And the two states are separated by this barrier, the energy barrier with EA, the activation energy. So you have the KT, like thermal energy. So this is a thermal assisted uh, switching mechanism, right? So you have some thermal energy disturb the state. And again, you can measure the retention time at different temperature, and then draw this Arrhenius plot, this one over KT plot, and you have seen this in many times. This is, this is a generic in number of time memories. No matter you are talking about like uh, land flash, or R1 phase change memory, or this STTM run, all of them will show this kind of one over KT plot. And in this example, if you extract, extract the slope, it's 1.84 EV electron volts for the activation energy. And then, of course, we care about the, this 3 times 10 to the power 8 seconds, uh, that is 10 year. And then you extract the, the, the temperature. So to have a good retention, typically the Delta here is about 40 to 60. So you can back calculate what is the EA. If the room temperature is 26 mini EV, then times 40. So let's say times the middle one 50. Right, it's about 1.3 EV, right? 1.3 EV.
but the thermal stability this delta has a trade-off with the switching current density so typically higher delta should, should be this trend okay for the same kind of material except this one then we should have this kind of a trend this is because the thermal barrier The higher the barrier, the longer the retention, because it's more difficult for the state to flip from one to the other. That means at the same time, it's more difficult to write the data. This is the same like, dilemma as we discussed in the S run, right? And actually in all kinds of memory, you can think of this, right? the write and the read or the write and the retention has a conflict because when you write the data you want to flip the state when you are in the retention mode you don't want to flip the state there is a conflict so here if the barrier thermal stability barrier is ea is large then the retention is good at the same time, it's more difficult to write. You need to apply larger currents to switch. So here, the figure of merit, sometimes it's defined as a current density, Jc, critical current density, Jc0, divided by the delta, which is the thermal stability. So you want uh, this value to be small. The small, the better. That means as the same delta, that means the same retention, you want a lower current to switch. And uh, another consideration is about the scaling trend. So actually the STDM run, as we discussed earlier, if you scale down, because of the current density, is a, a constant giving the same material. Of course, you can change the material for the MTG stack and the current density will change. But with the same material, the current density is a constant. So that means when you make a large device and small device, then the, because the JC is the same, so the actually I say the critical current. Of course, when you scale, then the I say will reduce and also this will reduce with proportional to the square of the diameter and say the size because this is related to the area right so if you think the f this will be dependent on the f square so here we show the transistor drivability and the red, red current in this plot for different feature size. So the key point here is that the transistor, if you think about the transistor, 1T1R, the transistor width, 1T1R, right? So this transistor's width, you have the transistor W and L, right? So when you scale the transistor, Technology load, the width, the width will reduce, and the current that flow from the transistor, the drain current, will be proportional to the width, right? To the width. But here, the critical current proportional to the area, or let's say the f square. So that means this proportional to the F, and the IC proportional to the F square. In other words, the critical current shrink faster than the transistor's drain current. So here, if you look at the plot here, the solid line is the red current 
and it, it shrink faster. And then for the transistors drive current, the dash line is shrink uh, slower. So the question to you is that, is this a good news or bad news in terms of scaling for the STDM run? It's a good news. The reason is that, for example here, let's look at this one. If the current density is four mega per centimeter square for this particular MTJ stack, at uh, let's say your transistor current needs to be larger, right? Needs to be larger than the red current. So here at let's say at 65 nanometer load. You need a transistor like 10F, oops, the dash line, 10F, this one is larger than here. So this is good. You need a transistor to provide enough current, right? You want the dash line to be above the solid line. Well, in 22 nanometer load, you see here, 4F in the transistor width, could be larger than the solid line. This is the same solid line for this particular MTJ stack. So that means at 22 nanometer load, you just need 4F for the transistor width to drive this STDM run. So it's good news in terms of the scaling. Does this make sense? And next, let's talk about the endurance. So the STDM run, on, in general, the M run is regarded as good retention, oh sorry, good endurance. So theoretically speaking, you can cycle the M run for, for a very large number. Theoretically, it could reach infinity if you only consider the spin state, there's no limitation on that. But practically, there will be an endurance limitation that is limited by the MTO. Remember, there is a, you have the free layer and pin layer, and in the middle, you have the oxide MTO. The MTO may break down after many cycles because the electrons turn through many times. And then this may create the defect in the MGO. And then the MGO eventually may break down. So here the MTJ voltage is very critical. The right voltage you apply to the stack will determine the lifetime of the MGO layer. And this is caused by the TDDB, the time dependent dielectric breakdown. This is related to the breakdown of the MGO. And this can be tested by the, this kind of uh, accelerated uh, endurance test. So basically you measure the cycle before breakdown. So basically the endurance cycle at higher voltage because you want to accelerate this process. For example here, we can have, uh, let's say, so let's look at those those two curves here. So this is a T63. That means this is when you test an array, 63% of the cell fail. This is average average cycle for the 63% of the array fail under the continuous cycling. That means you switch from one state to the other and then switch it back. So you keep this endurance. So you can test this at higher voltage. For example, if you do it at 1.5 volts, then like a 100 cycle, you can break down the MTJ. And then you can keep doing this test at different voltage. For example, here at like 0.9 volts, and then you wait for like 10 to power or 10 cycles. But you cannot really measure the 10 to the power 16 
because uh, if you are a reliability engineer, you have to predict the lifetime of your product maybe within a week. You cannot wait the testing to finish, right? If you want to, you have done your homework, 10 to the power 16, right? If you switch it every 10 nanoseconds, that will give you like 10 year, a few years to finish that test. You cannot do that. So you have to do the projection. And then you, you test until here, maybe 10 to the power 10, you use like a few days. And then you have to rely on the projection. So there are two kinds of models to project. One is called E model, one is called one over E model. So the E model, the stash line, is simply that the uh, breakdown cycle is proportional, exponentially proportional to the E, the field, or the voltage. And the other one is one over E. So I think one of the equation E model is proportional to the exponential E. And the other one is proportional to exponential negative one over E. So that two kinds of model. One is E model, one is one over E model. So if you use one over E model, this actually comes from the, if you recall, the F internally has one over this kind of formula, one over like the voltage negative one over the field. But more practically, if you consider the triple assisted turtling, it's more like this one. So anyway, so we can use the lower bound for the projection, the dash line, right? So here, normally, for the MTJ, the right voltage is about 0.5, 2.6 in this range. This is your nominal, <coughs> nominal voltage in operation. So here, if you look at the projection, then you can think, okay, this is good, because this is like more than 10 to the power 15 or 16. For like most of the cells, like 63%, less than the average. But here, the 1 ppm is the tail. 1 ppm is, the, you know, 1 out of 1 million. This is like a, a 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1 percent. So one out of one million, basically. So this is the tail of the distribution. And even for the worst case, you can ensure this is a, around 10 to the power 14 cycle for the worst case in the array. So this is how we do the lifetime projection for the STTM run. So any questions? Okay, let me see if any questions online. All right, next, let's talk about the STDM run technology evolution. And actually, we have discussed the field M run in the last lecture, and this is no longer pursued by industry, because as we discussed, here you need to use extremely large current to generate the oscillating field, this is not good. Then we prefer to use the current to directly go through the MTJ stack to switch, and this is called the STTM run. But so far, what we discussed is this in-plan STTM run. And next, we are going to introduce this perpendicular MTJ which is current mainstream of the industry. So the difference here is that for the in-plan STTM run, this, you can think this is the first generation of the STTM run. And what, this is what we discussed so far. So in-plan means the MTJ stack, the magnetization, like uh, this magnetization is in parallel with the plan here. Plan means horizontal, horizontally. This is in plan. And the perpendicular MTJ is actually like this. You still have three layers. And in the middle, you have the MGO. 
But here the magnetization is pointing up and down. It's, in, it's perpendicular to the plane, to this plane. But still you have the two states, parallel and anti-parallel. For example, the pinned layer is always pointing down, for example, then the free layer can be up and down. So in this case, the, the free layer can be left and right. So this is a perpendicular, perpendicular. And uh, here we show the differences in the schematic. So why are we interested in this perpendicular MTJ? The reason is that it allows better scaling or lower red current at the same data retention in lifetime. So the reason is that you can think of the anisotropy of the shape of the shape of the MTJ. If it's in plan, if you recall we talk about hard access and easy access. So basically when you make make a magnet, right? You can think of your, your magnet. You need to have this kind of elliptical shape for the hard access and the easy access. If you want the magnet to have good data retention, you need to make the shape like a very anisotropic. Yeah. So here, and so it's like the long axis is very long, and the easy axis is very short. Right? That this may, makes make this magnet stable, the retention good. Right? When you flip from this side to the other side, it's very difficult because this is uh, defined by the shape. So here we are looking at the top view, top view. This elliptic, elliptical shape, and we have this very long axis and short axis. So typically the length larger than twice of the width. So that means the long axis twice larger than twice of the easy axis to have a good retention. Or in other words, you can think if you have, you have like a very symmetric shape, you have a round shape. Then if this is your magnetization direction, it can easily flip to any direction, right? Because this is equal. Right? So the data retention will be bad. And this data retention will be good because this will be confined to those two directions, the mag magnetization. So you need this geometry to improve the retention. However, if you do the perpendicular design, then you can have the round shape from the top view. Why is that? Because from the side of view, you can have the elliptic shape, or let's say the anisotropy in the geometry. From the side of view, you can have your long axis here and easy axis here. This is from side view, okay, side view. This is from top view, right? And then for the perpendicular one from the top, you can be a circle, right, round shape. Because it's like this pen, right? If you you're pointing up and down, this is perpendicular design, right? And then you only need to apply like F by F for the top view area. But if you make it per, uh, in, in plan, then you have to make this non access to occupy a lot of space in the lateral space. So that's why the perpendicular MTJ is more preferred by the industry today. And also from the switching point of view, the implant MTJ, the switching path by the spin transfer torque, that means by the current, 
and the switching path by the thermal activation is different. This is because when you apply the current this way, using the hand, hand, uh, right hand rule, then your torque is along the blue dash path. But thermally, this mechanization or the spin state can only move in plane in, within the material. They have to move this way. So those two are not really uh, consistent. But for the perpendicular case, if you look at this one, then both the transfer torque, if you apply the current this way, then both the torque by the current and also the thermal activation will follow the same path. So that's why it's easier to strip. That means lower red current. So the perpendicular MTJ provides both advantages in the data retention and the reduction of the red current. So that's why in today's industry product, I believe all of them use the perpendicular MTG. There are many challenges in fabricating the MT STDM run. I will skip the, some of the detailed discussions. But as we discussed earlier, the on-off ratio is pretty small, like only two. That will impose a challenge for the sense amplifier design. And also we have the trade-off between the thermal stability and the red current density. So you can engineer your MTJ stack to either have a good retention or you can have a lower red current density. But it's very difficult to achieve both at the same time. And also there are some manufacturing challenges, especially during the edge of the, M, the, the, the STTM run stack because there are many layers. And especially the MGO, if you etch this, the edge may have some defect. This will cause some leakage path between the two layers. Then that will cause the leakage current and also cause early breakdown of the MGO. That will limit the lifetime of the endurance. So there are many practical challenges in the manufacturing as well. So any questions? So let's look at some of the test chip from the industry. So this is one of the early uh, product, not product, I mean the prototype uh, from this startup company called Grandis. And later this company was acquired by Samsung and become the Samsung's STTM run process, essentially. So this was uh, like almost 10 years ago, this test chip, around 2010. So this is like a 256 kilobit and in 90 nanometer CMOS at that time. So here you, you see the MTJ is on top and the metal three and metal four. And this is a transistor here. So you have the contact wire. So it's one T one R like this. If you zoom in, MTJ, you have many layers, and in the middle you will have this like, free layer, MGO, and a pinned layer. And from the circuit point of view, you have this one T1R, and typically in like uh, two cells share one string contact to the bit line. This is like DRAM, as we discussed before. And then you have the decoder and so on, the peripheral circuits. So the matrix, uh, for example, the red current is about 200 microamps and uh, you can write and read within 20 nanoseconds and endurance is uh, projected to be in larger than 10 to the power 13. So those are the reasonable metrics from this test chip. So if you look at some of the detailed data from this chip, so here if you measure the resistance of the two states, the anti-parallel and parallel states, or the HRS and LRS, or the one state and zero states, 
And uh, as typically we call low reason state to be one state. This is zero state. Typically we call like this. Anyway, this is an arbitrary, but by convention we call lower resistance as one state because you read out larger currents. But anyway, if you look at the resistance values, it's like around two, two kilo ohm and four kilo ohm. So the on-off ratio, right, is like two x. And if you translate that to the TMR, it's about 100%. We need to have a very tight distribution, that's the sigma of the distribution, right? So one sigma is like 4% here, 3% and 4%. So we need to have a very clear margin between the tail and the tail. And then this is the endurance test. So basically here, we can measure the on-off ratio, or let's say measure the on-off ratio with the, the cycles, and then it's measured up to 10 to the power 12, and even 10 to the power 13 measured. This is really measured. So the on-off ratio is almost a constant. That means that the device is still functional no degradation. And then, of course, if you measure many cells, there will be a distribution in terms of the on-off ratio. And then we do this projection with the right voltage, right? This is like the E model. At a different right voltage, this is on the negative side. But if you do the projection, then you can reach even 10 to the power 16 cycles at the nominal operation voltage. For example, like 0.6 volts. Negative is because here the test of the, for example, the parallel to the anti-parallel switches. So this is negative 0.6 volts. And also around similar time frame, like 2010, Toshiba also published uh, 64 megabit STDM run in 65 nanometer technology load. And here are the more parameters for the chip size and cell size. And array efficiency, like 50%, and other like uh, characteristics. And here it shows the resistance as a function of the uh, red voltage. And red voltage is about 0.5 volt or 500 millivolts. And then the switching current is about 50 microamps. And later, I believe Toshiba proposed to use this STDM run for the last level cache. And this was presented in this ISCC paper, 2015. So here, it is one megabit uh, STDM run. And uh, it really optimizes the MTG stack to make it uh, pretty fast, like uh, 3 nanoseconds for the read and write. Of course, compared to the S run, this is still slow. But uh, 3 nanoseconds, I would say, probably comparable to the last level cache, like L3 or L4. Of course, you cannot compete with L1. L1, you know, the S run is below 1 nanosecond. But this is comparable with L3 or if you want to insert L4, then you can do that. So basically here in this uh, system level simulation benchmark, it uh, assumes that you have the uh, eight cores and then L1 cache, 32 kilobyte, L2, 256 kilobytes, those are s run in the system simulation. And only the L3 is the 32 megabytes shared L3 cache using the STDM run. And this is done by simulation. And so with the measured data from this chip. So here you see that if you use all the S run as the uh, three level cache, then you normalize the energy of the system to be one. And then if you use STDM run, then you can reduce the total energy by 70 eight percent and the most of the reduction come from 
you say this yellow part, that is a leakage. Because in many ap applications, your cache is in the standby mode or sleep mode. For the STDM run, you can power off that bank to save the energy. But as well, as you know, you have to keep the VGD on. So especially for the edge applications, right, if your activity is not very high, then this STDM run based uh, last level cache could, could be useful. And the STTM run since 2010, it drives worldwide interest from the industry. And uh, here is just uh, some news around the 2010. Really, this is really like uh, booming for the STTM run around that time. And there are many companies working on the STTM run. And uh, there are uh, big companies like Intel, TSMC, and uh, Global Foundry, and Toshiba IBM, and also Qualcomm has been investing STTM run for a long time. And there are many startups as well, like those like Avalanche Technology and uh, the TDK Everspin. So those are the startup companies. So there are like more than 10 companies working on STTM run these days. So here are some recent uh, results. So Tohoku University from Japan actually has been doing a lot of great work on the STTM run. This is a university, but it has really good fabrication capability for the STTM run. So this is uh, the recent result from IDM 2018. So this is a scale to 40 nanometer load uh, with 128 megabit STTM run chip, and you can is a speed, so it's like a 40 nanoseconds, 30 nanoseconds for the write and the read. So this is good for e flash replacement. This is not good for STD. Uh, it's not good for the last level cache because the you see the speed is still much higher than the last level cache, and I will explain the differences in the next. But let's look at a few examples first, in recent examples. And this is the Samsung's demonstration at IEDM 2019. This is one gigabit embedded STDM run in 28 nanometer FDSOI platform. And the uh, cell size, this number, and uh, it measures the wide operation temperature, and then pass the retention requirements at 105 degrees C and the 10 to power 10 endurance cycles. And the TSMC, ISCC 2020, 32 megabit STTM run at a 22 nanometer process and the read speed around 10 nanoseconds and the retention time also good and endurance the less. Uh, this is at the tail bit, I believe. One megabit, the tail is about 10 to the power of 6 and different cycles. And the Intel also reported the STTM run progress in the IDM 2019. And uh, actually, Intel has two flavors. One is for the embedded number tile memory. This is for like e-flash replacement. The other one is really for the L4 cache. So the difference here is that you can engineer the STTM run geometry even with the same material stack. You simply engineer the geometry, you can get different property. For example, in Intel's process, if you want to have good data retention for the embedded number tile memory, the cell size here is about 70 to 80 nanometer for the MTJ size here. So larger size, more stable for the magnetization. Therefore, it's good for data retention, good for embedded number time memory. But of course, the red current will be larger, the red current normalized. But if you 
we want to make it faster for the cache, because normally for the ENVM, the write speed is like 20 milliseconds. For the cache, we say that we really need a 3 nanosecond. So if you want to increase, and let's say, decrease the write latency or increase the speed, you have to make the MTG smaller to make it easier to flip. So in this case, use like 55 nanometer for the diameter for the MTJ. You can make it easier to flip, faster to flip, like 3 nanoseconds. At the same time, the red current will reduce. But the trade-off would be the retention. This one, you can ensure 10-year lifetime for the retention. And this one, you can only suspend the data for one second. But for cache, probably OK, because you need to frequently update your data anyway for the cache. Right? So one second data retention, probably OK. So there's a trade-off, two flavors. And I believe Intel demonstrated both options as the same technology load, the 22 nanometer FFL, a FinFET platform for the low power and IF. This is a versatile platform for Intel. It demonstrates almost anything on this FFL platform. You can tailor this for low power, ultra low power, or embedded memory, or RF at this technology load, analog and RF. So here, this is a, a, a summary. So basically, I would say the SDDM run is in mass production. You have the product from industry. And all the major foundries offer the STDM RAM product, mostly in 22 nanometer to 28 nanometer. So here you see those demonstrations from TSMC, Intel, Samsung, Global Foundry in the recent years. So the STDM RAM is the, the most mature nominal memory among all the emerging technologies in terms of the industry availability. So next, I'll quickly go over those slides. So basically, this is a, a summary for the recent demonstrations of the product from those major companies. And here we summarize the data from the recent conferences in terms of the on-off ratio and the MTJ size, and then the cell size in terms of F square, we normalize that and then the write and read pulse condition and the endurance and the retention. So here, the first table, this is for e-flash replacement. So this one needs good retention, right? So you see that the retention can be good, larger than 10 years or even 20 years at higher temperature. But the trade-off here is the endurance, right? You see those two. So you have good retention, but endurance typically is like 10 to the power 6, 10 to the power 5, 10 to the power 6, around that. But this is good because for e-flash, even for, like, for flash, as we discussed earlier, right, the endurance is around that, 10 to the power 5, 10 to the power 6 for the embedded flash. So it just meets the same target as the embedded flash. The retention is good and endurance is reasonable for the e-flash. And the speed is typically like slower, tens of nanoseconds to hundreds nanoseconds. And cell size, if you normalize that, is like 10,000 F square to 100 F square. And then the different flavor, as we discussed earlier, for the last level cache, so you have to trade off the retention with the speed. So the retention typically reduce to like seconds or minutes. You see this. But for cache, we need to have good endurance. You need to frequently write the data. So here you trade off with endurance. Endurance can be generally larger than 10 to the power 12 cycles. And the speed is also reduced to a few nanoseconds. 
a few nanoseconds, less than 10 nanoseconds from different foundries. So you see the two options for STDM run. One is for eFlash and one is for last level cache. And you have to engineer the MTG stack differently for different op options. And uh, any questions here? And lastly, we will briefly talk about one of the newest technology that is under the research. This is called the SOT MRAN, spin optical torque. So SOT is a spin orbit torque. SOT MRAN. And the SOT MRAN, the difference is that, that here, we have the same MTG stack. But the difference is that here, in the bottom here, we have a metal, and typically it's a heavy metal. Heavy metal means the at atomic mass is large for this metal, for example, like platinum or, uh, I forgot, platinum and maybe copper. I'm not so sure. So some heavy metal, I believe platinum is there. Or maybe tungsten. Yeah, I remember tungsten. Yeah, tungsten was there. So anyway, with some metal. So this blue, like, uh, then is a metal, and that is directly interfaced with the MTG stack. So the SOT switching is a little bit similar as the field switching MRAN we discussed earlier. The only difference is that here, the metal wire directly interface with the MTJ stack. But for the field MRAN, if you recall earlier, there is a metal right, right wire line underneath, underneath the MTJ, but this is separated. So you generate the oscillating field, the magnetic field, by passing through the current here to switch this layer. Here is the same mechanism. You apply red current on this heavy metal, and then it will generate the uh, candle field. We cannot say this field. It's called the spin optical effect. But anyway, so the idea is to pass the current on the heavy metal, and then due to this spin optical effect, then it can switch the direction of this magnetization of the bottom layer. So in this case, this will be the pinned layer, and the bottom will be the free layer. Because here the current will directly change the magnetization of the free layer, which is interfaced with the metal. And there are three types of the SOTM run, depending on the direction of the current and the magnetization. For example, this type X, both the red current and the magnetization I, along the x, direct, x axis. So this is type X. Type Y, the magnetization here, the long, basically the long axis is on the y direction, and the right current is still on the x. So here in the three examples here, the right current is always along the x axis, but the magnetization, the long axis of that magnet The first one is along the x direction, the second one is along the y direction, and the third one is along the z direction. And here the x, type x and z is external magnetic field to assist the switching because there is no, there is no asymmetry. But type y is field free, you don't need to apply external magnetic field, but, but it's slower. So we don't need to care about those subtle differences here, but the principle here is that you apply red current to this heavy metal, and that can switch the free layer, the green one, here. So if you compare this with STTM run, what would be the difference? The red path is different. So here in the SOTM run, your right is through the 
heavy metal you apply current around this direction. But when you read, you still do this 1T1R, this 1T1R. So this would be your read path. So here the read and the write and the write are decoupled. So this may potentially improve the endurance and the disturb to the state. Because if you do the STTM run for the 1T1R, right, for both write and read, you will go through the same path. The only difference is that in the write, you apply large current. When you do the read, you apply small current or small voltage. So they share the same path. Therefore, there will be the disturb issue. But for this one, the write and the read are completely separate. Then this one will be more safe in terms of the disturb and the data retention and so on. And uh, there are some tricks to design the SOTM run. For example, this is from Tohoku University. And then they call this is the magnetic field free canted SOTM run. So the trick is that for the long axis of the magnetization, it is pointing to this direction. And then the metal wire for the right is pointing to this direction. So there is a canting angle here. So that provides, that pre breaks the symmetry. And then it can rely on the current only here to flip the magnetization of the free layer. You don't need to use the external magnetic field. And this has been demonstrated in this uh, CMOS process. So basically here you have to have this SOT channel, which is this heavy metal. And then you have MTJ here. And typically for the SOTM run, I have forgot to mention that you need a two transistor as a selection. So 1T1R now become 2T1R because you need a read, a selection transistor for the normal 1T1R, and then you need a write transistor to control the write pass. So you need a two, two transistor. So theoretically speaking, the cell size will increase. So the advantage for the SOTM RAM mostly is in the ultra-fast switching. So the SOTM RAM has been experimentally measured to be switchable between, I mean, below one nanosecond. So if you really want to have a faster switching, let's say, comparable with a level one cache, SOTM RAM is the only solution among all the emerging number of memories. So here experimentally it demonstrated the switching can be down to 0.35 nanoseconds if you convert to the clock frequency it's like 3 gigahertz this is uh, tested under around 800 millivolts so it's pretty reasonable small voltage 800 millivolts can switch in 0.3 nanoseconds so this is comparable with L1 cache. So if you want to replace the L1 S run, then the SOTM run is the only possible solution. But I would say the SOTM run is a very new phenomenon. Uh, only has been researched for a few years. So it's at a very early stage in terms of the re uh, 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 research and development. So here are some so here are some summary from the Tohoku University in terms of their work. And uh, in this case, they integrate the SOTM run on a 300 millimeter wafer on 55 nanometer process for the first time. And as we discussed, a 0.35 nanosecond switching time. And the thermal, activ uh, thermal stability factor is 70. So this is pretty good. You can, uh, can simultaneously satisfy the retention more than 10 years. And uh, yeah, so this is pretty much the summary from this work. But the only challenge I can see for the SOTM run to replace the ST, uh, S run, 
L1 cache. Although it has good switching speed, the write current is still too high. So it didn't list, oh, it's listed here, but it's in the current density. But if you convert this to the write current directly, this typically will be like 500 microns. So you need to pass 500 microns to switch this like 0.35 nanosecond. This 500 microns is applied to that heavy metal. So you have this SOT and then this layer. You need to apply 500 microns to this SOT metal. This is a challenge. This is too large. So we have additional transistor here to drive this 500 microamp. So from the cell size point of view, this transistor will be huge. And you have additional transistor here. Of course, in the layout, it won't be on top. But from the circuit schematic, it's on top of this ST, uh, MTJ. But of course, in the real layout, you have to put this down somewhere here maybe, and then let's do this. So here basically you have some space for another transistor and then connect to the MTG on top. So from the cell size point of view, the SOTM run compared with S run, the advantage is not that large. So if the S run cell size is one, the SOT may be 0.8. 0.6 to 0.7 to 0.8. So not too much advantage in terms of the area because you have two transistors and the transistor size is huge to drive this 500 micron. So this is the main challenge for the SOT. The research needs to be done to reduce this red current. All right, so this is another example from the Tohoku University for the SOT chip, only at 4 kilobyte level. And I will skip the details. So this is still at early stage in the kilobyte level. And you see the STTM run is already in tens of megabytes. So this is uh, still early research. All right, so this is the summary for the MRAN section. So first we talk about the field switching MRAN, and this one has been abandoned by industry because it cannot scale. And STT MRAN is more attractive, and STT MRAN is the mainstream for the industry right now. And there is a fundamental trade-off in the STT, that is the switching current density versus the thermal stability. So that gives us two flavors, right? One is more thermally stable for the e-flash, and the other one is easier to flip, that is for the cache. So for STT, and we also discussed that today, the industry prefers the perpendicular MTJ because it offers better scalability with those trade-offs. And the STT MRAN has been positioned for the e-flash replacement. This is of interest to the MCU microcontroller. And also it has been engineered towards high retention. And also some of those companies position this for the automotive uh, uh, applications, right? You want to use this under the hood of the engine, right, for your car. And also STDM run has a theoretically non-endurance and uh, is attractive for the last level cache. But uh, we have to be careful from the density perspective the STTM run must scale to the leading edge node. This is because STTM run mostly demonstrated at 22 nanometer today. So even though it has higher density than S run as a 22 nanometer load, from the absolute area point of view, it may be still larger than 7 nanometer S run, right? Because 7 nanometer S run F itself is smaller. So the advantage as the same technology node is about 2x to 3x. So let's say if the S run area is 1, STT is about 0.3 to 0.5x. 
at the same technology load. But S run, you know, has been, this is 22 nanometer S run, but if S run, if S run is 7 nanometer, this one must be scaled to like uh, maybe 0.2x already. So the STT needs to be scaled down as well. So I would say the STT, maybe one generation behind will be comparable, will be more advantage. Let's say 22 nanometer S run probably, sorry, let's, let me put it this way. Uh, Maybe 7 nanometer S run, if you design STT as a 14 nanometer or 10 nanometer, you can get a similar density, right? Maybe this is more comparable. But if S run is scaled to 3 nanometer very soon, I believe next year, right? Then if STT cannot go to 7 nanometer, then STT has no advantage in terms of density compared to the SRAM because SRAM has been scaled to 3 nanometer. So STT must scale down to at least 7 nanometer to be more competitive. So scaling is important for the STT MRAM. And I believe I heard from some of my contacts at industry, they are working on 7 nanometer STT at this time. So anyway, so the STT is uh, mature compared to other emerging technology. And the most, most of the foundries, like Samsung, TSMC, Global, Intel, are offering commercial process at 28 and 22 nanometer load. This is not for SRAM replacement. This is for E-Flash. For E-Flash, the competitor you know is um, uh, like 1.5 T split gate, no flash. Right, which is mostly at 40 nanometer load. So this is already more competitive than the E-Flash. And uh, lastly, we talk about SOT. This could be the next generation of a high speed, next sub nanosecond switching. But still the red current and energy is too high today. With uh, the researchers need to do more jobs to reduce the red current, therefore the red energy. All right, I think that's all for the MRAN section. Any questions? If no, we will stop here today. <laughs>